Hey everybody and welcome back. This is part two to the lesson that we just began. So what we'll do now is we're going to take these rules or these negative exponents and we're going to see how we can sort of bring them into or uncover them through the use of some different examples. Okay. So let's consider uh, one on measurement. Okay. So what I've done in this one is I've switched or tweaked the formula for the volume of a pyramid. Okay. So we have a square-based pyramid. It has dimensions 3 by 3 and a height of 6. So the formula that we have here calculates the volume of the pyramid. Okay. So what we'll do is let's move forward and apply that. So the volume expression, okay, so 3 to the minus 1 multiplied by B times H. So the B is the base area. So our base area Okay, so the B would be a 3 by 3, okay, or 3 to the power of 2. That is equal to 9. But since how I have a lot of powers of 3, what I'm thinking is I'm going to keep that as 3 squared. So 3 to the minus 1 times 3 squared times the height. Now the height in this case is equal to 6. So substituting in 6. So I'm just going to take advantage of some of the exponent rules that I have just to make the mathematics a bit easier. Now, these numbers are easier because they're smaller to work with, uh, but I'm going to apply the rules just the same. So 3 to the minus 1 times 3 to the 2. I could add the exponents there because of the multiplication, and then times it by 6 after. So that would be 3 to the 1, which is 3 times 6, or 18. And that would be cubic units. Another way to do this, just to get all the same technical, is to take the 3 to the minus 1, and using the negative exponent rule, is to create a fraction and switching the sign of the exponent. So I could take 1 third, and then 3 squared is 9, and then times 6. So there are many different ways to do this. A third of 9 is 3, so 3 by 6 gives us another 18 cubic units. So although we've done this before, and it seems a little over the top, we're going to see that in some more complicated examples, or as you grow your mathematical background, if you take math in the future, having this facility or this capability to see things and work with things differently are definitely going to be of use and assistance to you when you're solving problems. Okay, Let's apply this to one more. Let's have a look at something from the world of finance. Now, although we're not in that unit yet, there are mathematical ideas that we can apply even to what we're doing now. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Uh, John has a $6,000 loan. He has eight years to pay it off. But what he would like to do is he's not wanting to try to pay this off early. Okay. So when you do pay a loan off well in advance, it is possible to secure a discounted percent, okay? a discounted interest rate. So the interest rate for John is going to be 8% per year. And compound is semi-annually. So this is a new set of terminology for us. So the notion of compounding interest, and doing that semi-annually. So we want to figure out what is John going to pay back today? What will the bank take? So prior to setting this up, I need you to know about a few things. I need you to know that the term semi-annual in this problem is going to mean that interest is calculated twice per year. Okay. So that means every six month anniversary, we're going to end up at the end of that period, called a conversion period, is paying interest on the loan. Over the eight years, that means that if John took the eight years to pay that off, for every year, for eight years, he would pay that twice a year, or every six months, resulting in 16 interest periods, or conversion periods. Okay. So further down here you can see that for each conversion period 
what happens is that every six month period, we're going to end up paying 4% for the conversion period. Okay. So the banks, what they'll do, or any loaning institution, or even for investing your money, growing it, you would divide the interest rate by the compound frequency. Okay. So semi-annual is twice per year. So you cut the annual rate down uh, by two. So let's take half. So let's take these ideas, this notion, and let's apply that here. Okay, so I'm just going to move this back in, and then we'll get rid of the ink that's on the screen for now. And we'll see how a negative exponent might apply in this scenario. So a formula for this, which we'll study much more deeply when we get into our finance unit, doesn't mean we can't apply it, is the following. So the value of P, this is known as the present uh, value. So that corresponds to what will John pay back today? What is that acceptable amount he's paying today? Here is the loan amount. This amount here, this is what helps to calculate the interest uh, over the lifetime of the loan, and you can see how we have the 0 .04. 0 .04 is the interest rate in a decimal form. The 16, of course, that was the exponent that was derived from the 8 times 2 conversion periods, and it's expressed as a negative exponent. So to solve this, we can directly input it to the calculator, but I think what I'd like to do is to take advantage of the negative exponent. So this calculation can be broken into two parts. So it's $6,000 times the interest rate compounded minus 16. So we can take advantage of that negative exponent and we can create a fraction, one point, sorry, one over 1.04, and then flip the sign of the exponent to be positive 16. What that means is that we can bring that back into the original form when we multiply numbers together, so a fraction by a fraction. It's really 6,000 over 1, top times top and bottom times bottom. That just moves the 1.04 into the denominator. So the use of the negative exponent is beneficial in the sense that we can apply it to a financial problem. So let's calculate and see what we come up with. So using your calculator as well, so I'm going to take 6,000. I'm going to divide that by, and I'm going to open up some brackets because we need to do an order of operations. So 1.04, and that will be to the power of so 16. Close the bracket off. Now, once I close the bracket, that's the answer in the denominator. Okay, that's the answer to this, just this little piece here, to the power. And I did equals again in order to make a divide. So under division, I get 3203.45. So this is approximately, and this is a dollar amount, 3203, $3,203.45. So the bank would accept today, okay, $3,203.45 uh, to pay off what would have been, or what is uh, Jonathan's $6,000 loan, okay? Because that loan includes what he borrowed, it also includes all the interest that's accrued. So moving forward, uh, here's a few things you can focus on. These will be posted on the course website. But in this order, or actually in any order you want to complete them, so the, this is your assignment. Okay. So the first one involves just a basic example, one example, two from the lesson, uh, just working with the basic principles of negative exponents. Number two involves uh, the use of the formula for a cone. So instead of a pyramid, you can use that cone. And then number three, that's going to take you into, um, sorry, I got these mixed up, number one, this one is about finance, okay? Number three, it focuses on finance. That's required, in fact, they're all required. 
the number three down here. This is the one that goes into kind of your basic principles. And then it gets you working into some, uh, especially with number 12 and number 17, especially number 17 gets you thinking in terms of, you know, algebraic applications for these ones.